All right. There on page 331, we're going to talk about some of the other paragraphs inside of a lease. Once again, there is no going to be a question about name six paragraphs in a lease or anything like that. But each paragraph, you have to understand the concept of what that paragraph does. The funny thing is, my lease started out, when I started out in 1999 with my first rental, I think my lease was like four pages. The last lease I signed with a residential tenant, I think now is like 13 pages. I know, it gets tough. Because what happens is, stupid things that people do, you have to end up putting in the lease that you would think, hey, that's not normal. Uh, for instance, my, uh, the one that I love to go to is where I grew up, even though I grew up in a rural community of Greenfield, no one ever parked on their front lawn. But apparently that's a big thing here in the city. All right? And I had tenants parking on the front lawn and the kids playing in the driveway. I get the concept. You want the place the kids to play. But when they were driving in the lawn and in the spring, they left big tire ruts in the yard to the tune of about $1,000 worth of work that when they moved out, I had to fix with a yard company come in and roll it flat and reseed it and grow it again. So I had to add in my lease no parking in the front lawn. So once again, the lease kind of grows each time you see something stupid and you're like, oh. <laughs> Uh, I had a lease that residential property, you would think that you need to not put it's for residential use only since it's a residential house, right? Well, I had one where brand new carpet and all kinds of stuff, so we said no pets. And they're like, oh, yeah, we don't have pets. I'm like, okay, that's cool. Went to visit them as a surprise visit, drove by. Not only did they have pets, she was running a dog grooming business out of the garage of the house. So not only was she violating the lease with the pets, she was also violating zoning by running a business out of a residential property. So I had to put in my lease to be used for residential pro you know, purposes only. No businesses without the permission of the landlord and all the appropriate zoning and permits will be allowed. So I had to put another instruction in. So my lease just kept getting bigger and bigger. And now it's almost so big that I, it, it even, you know, discourages me when I sign one. So I have to, may have to go back and relook at it. I don't know. But some of the paragraphs that are given in there, for instance, the possession. The possession is obviously the one the tenant wants. That's the main benefit you give them. You give them possession from some time beginning to some time in. You actually describe the use, the use of the property to be used only as residential. Now don't forget, you guys are commercial, so that may be a bigger clause if you're doing commercial leasing, only to be used as a certain item because once again, your building is sitting in a zoning district which we will get to in a future chapter. So you need to know that if I'm in you know, business zoning, I can't have an industrial company in there. So in this clause, you will write, hey, this only be used for this type of zoning. The term of the lease, this is the paragraph that defines the estate for years or period to period or whatever, and it would have the beginning and the end if it's an estate for years. All of that. Now here's a new one. New term called a security deposit. What's the purpose for a security deposit? <laughs> she said, so they don't trash your crib. <laughs> that would be, what is that on the web? They got the urban dictionary. That would be the urban definition. So they don't trash your crib. All right, which basically is true. It is to prevent the landlord or the lessor from suffering damages due to the lessee's actions, okay? Now, that could be physical damages, i.e. trashing your crib, 
It also could be other monetary damages, like not paying rent. All right, so your security deposit can cover not paying rent. If someone beats you and leaves a month early, and they're like, well, I ain't paying, that security deposit is there in place to make sure the landlord doesn't suffer damages, either physical or monetary, economic damages. All right? The other biggest issue with a security deposit, at least in Indiana, there is no law that requires it to be kept in a separate account. All right? Unlike what other? Earnest money. Earnest money cannot be kept in a broker's account. It has to be kept in a clearly identified earnest money account, and you can't mix them, or that's a violation of license law called commingling. In the landlord world, security deposit can be commingled into a personal account. Not a wise business idea, but not a violation. And a lot of times, I know property management companies that will keep all their security deposits and use them for like a repair account, a maintenance account. So they'll maintain the landlord's property, and then when the rent comes in, they take that rent out, put it back in the security deposit. That way, there's always some money to maintain your client's account. All right? So security deposits there to safeguard the lessor, but there is no requirement against commingling. This next section is where you're going to start seeing <coughs> the division of residential and commercial. All right? Improvements. What's an improvement? Way back, Chapter 1. An improvement is any man-made item. All right? In the residential world, almost always a tenant is not allowed to make any physical improvements to the property. In the commercial world, it's very common. Matter of fact, it's probably the rule of thumb. And if you know the slang, it's actually called TI, which stands for Tenants Improvements. Landlords don't do anything to the property. They expect that the tenant coming in is going to f improve the property to their benefit. For instance, Subway has a different layout than Walden Books. So when the tenant comes in, the landlord's going to go, okay, you fix it how you want. A good example is the wall that's actually right behind you guys. That wall I put in. When I rented this room, it literally was the slang term, what they call a white box. In the commercial world, you rent a white box, which looks like a big, giant white box, all right? There's no walls, and it's painted white. That's what this room exactly looked like. I came in, put this flooring down, painted this color, built that wall, because I wanted an office area segregated from the classroom area. If you go across the hall to their office over there, they've got five or six offices and one big conference area different than mine. So in the commercial world, tenants typically do their own improvements. And then we even have a term for it. It's called tenant improvement, TI. All right? Accessibility. We have discussed a little bit about the Americans with Disabilities Act. Have we not? No, that's property management. That's next chapter. So we probably should touch on it here. Accessibility. There are two, two titles or two sections, and they're called a title, two sections of the ADA that are very important for us. Title I of the Americans with Disability Act says that employers must make reasonable accommodations for their employees that may be handicapped, like lower desks, grab bars in the bathroom, 36-inch wide doors. Those are all requirements of the ADA for an employer. 
I was in a bathroom the other day that had the two handlebars on the beside the stall. When I got done, I dismounted. I felt like Bart Connor. Yeah, he sticks it. That would fall under Title I of the ADA. All right. Title III of the ADA. Notice I skipped one. Title I, this is Title III. There are others that we're not going to worry about. Title III is the access to public goods and services by a company, like the curb cut so the wheelchair can roll up on the curb, the elevator so that people in a wheelchair don't have to worry about stairs, all right, the automatic door openers. Those would all be Title III. I saw a sign the other day at McDonald's that said we have menus for the blind. That confused me. How are they going to see the sign? I told that to my wife. She goes, well, somebody with them could have told them that. And then, then read them the menu. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not going to read you the menu, but they have one in one here. Hand that to me. <coughs> That's your yeah. And McDonald's, it always cracks me up anyway. McDonald's has been selling the same thing for 20, 50, 60 years. And the person in front of you wants to stop and read the menu. You know, they're like, um, I'll take, look, it's been the same menu. And the other day I was so hot and heated, finally I couldn't take it anymore. I'm like, look, Mom, make up your mind. <laughs> so Title I, Title Three, One is employers with employees. And the key term you have to keep in mind is reasonable accommodations, not absolute. That means it's potentially possible that it's above my economic ability to make my building fixed. For example, I used to own 201 North Delaware, right just north of the Gold Street, Gold Building downtown. Three stories, no elevator. Because it was built a long time ago before the ADA was in place. We had stairs to all three floors. We had an exemption letter from the ADA saying that we were built prior to that, and the building structure could not handle an elevator because we looked at having one put on the roof, all the power, and so it could pull it up. Couldn't do one in the basement because there's tunnels. The city has tunnels. Couldn't do one on the roof because the structure wouldn't hold it. So we had an exemption from Title I of the ADA. So it's a reasonable accommodation for your employees, not necessarily absolute. So landlords have to make sure there's accessibility to your clients. So let me ask you a question. If I have a residential property, and I do, and a gentleman comes up to me and says, hey, I want to rent the property, but I'm in a wheelchair, I can't get up the stairs, and I say, ooh, I'm sorry, but uh, I can't rent to you. Is that legal? You would think it's not. It actually is under Title I, this reasonable accommodations. There, are, there is an exemption. The exemption says, if I don't have the economic wherewithal to adjust my building, that's an exemption. I literally can tell that guy, hey, I'm sorry. I cannot afford to build a ramp, put the grab bars in, lower the kitchen sinks, all of that. I can't do that. But if he says, I will pay for it, now that exemption has been taken away, and sure, I would rent to him. Okay? So that accessibility has stay there. It's an economic burden. I can't afford it. If they can remove that economic board burden, then that's fine. Okay? I, ha I had a guy with a seeing eye dog. And I, uh, he wanted to see the property. And he came in and started swinging the dog around. I'm like, what the hell? He's like, oh, I'm just looking around. <laughs> Don't laugh at that. That's wrong. He told me he used to skydive and had to quit because it scared the hell out of the dog. So that's, 
Reasonable accommodations is the term there. Now we get to maintenance, and maintenance is like improvements. You're going to see a big diversification. Typically, maintenance in the residential world is left to the landlord. There may be some small maintenance that's left to the tenant, like mowing the lawn. I've got one rental property where the tenant mows the lawn. They wanted to, they literally asked for that. Yeah, sure. All right. In the commercial world, very common that the commercial person takes care of the maintenance. All right. I'm going to change the audio so we can move on. <laughs> 